thought of something else. Is that I got to <laughs> You're doing so much better than my students. <laughs> <laughs> And and the uh, the the orchestral interpretation of of uh, of these two pieces as a result is different. as a whole and the colors of the French piece as a whole, how would you say it's And as opposed to vocal, what would you call then the French instruments, the way of playing and the sound? If you call the way of playing the Italian language, then you would call it the way of playing the French instruments. Yes, the Italian sound is more is more of a dancing sound. It, 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 the French. The French. So, if I say singing opposed to dancing. You would agree with that? No, I didn't. <laughs> or melody and rhythm. Yeah? Yes. What? They're not very uh, comparable in, in, in this. In, in uh -huh. They are comparable. You have to yeah, see them as comparable. I really want you to compare this and this. These are two things that have the same place in society. But we would just continue a little bit before I write something down. Maybe, maybe wait a little bit. I, I'm going to write something down as a result of what you have said, but there are two more remarks on that. So he was first. He was first? I don't know. I didn't see. I thought he was first. Just on this argument, don't add your own things no, down. It's, 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 yeah, it's the same. <laughs> Ladies, okay. <laughs> yes, but this is another. This is another element. I would like to to stick with her idea of having rhythm as opposed to, or having a more vocal sound as opposed to something else. I would to Yeah. 
А если вы декламируете, то вы вынуждены держаться ближе к тексту. It's, uh, it's possible that you don't see that yet, but uh, still linked to that same element is the aspect of having an open sound in Italian uh, music, where it has a more closed sound. Может быть, пока это не совсем ясно, но к, к этому же аспекту относится и более открытое свойство итальянской барочной музыки, и более закрытое французской. So this is actually what you have made, because I didn't make that, you made that. Вот это то, что There's an accurate list of um, how the differences are and where I proceed. They're unbelievingly close to the lists that were made at the end of the 17th century when this whole difference really became an issue. И на самом деле этот список очень близок к тем, которые делали в конце 17 века, когда эта разница действительно стала обсуждаться. Те, у кого есть handout, things that are um, oppositions that are made in, in contemporary lists or compilations of contemporary lists увидит, что компиляции современные компиляции тех списков, которые были сделаны в барочный период. Противопоставляют красоту барочности. Спокойствие So now the first column is always the French one, the second is the Italian. The first is French, the second is Italian. Charm versus brilliance. Delicacy, delicacy versus Noise. <laughs> um, douceur uh, versus charge. Uh, 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 elegant, elegant versus choleric. Gracious versus defigured. Uh, изящество uh, искаженности mm -hmm. intelligence versus deep uh, yeah. French naturalness versus the uh, detourné, uh, twitch, twitchedness in, in Italian music. Естественность противопоставляется какой-то изломанности. Netting versus diversity. Аккуратность, разнообразие. Nobleness versus excessiveness. Благородство противопоставляется Regularity versus extravagance. Правильность, экстравагантность. La belle simplicité versus fewer. Прекрасная красота противостояла яркости. Tenderness versus ah, gaitiness. Нежность, веселость. Touching, touching versus liberty, freedom. And there are a few more terms to describe just Italian. It's not really natural. It's not really natural. 
и справедливо будет сказать, что немецкая барочная музыка представляет у себя амальгаму лютеранского основания, лютеранского подхода к музыке, к музыке с французским и итальянским. So this opposition is really one of the central issues to the understanding of rock music as a whole. It is important, however, to know that these uh, differences that we just cited, that I just cited, are all tended. You know that they are from just from one side. Bias. Bias. Yes. Okay. So let's just have now before we go looking for the deeper reasons. Let's just describe the differences as they are. And you will recognize many of the elements that you have um, found in the lists uh, that you have made yourself. This is um, what I'm going to say now is a list for, for you, by the way, we're on page 8. This is an, an This is based on an, an um, this is based on, I mean, books on performance practice that treat the subject will describe you exactly what I'm going to describe you now. As first, the first item I would say is orchestration. It's important to know. Yeah, it's important to know that France invented the orchestra. And what do I understand uh, as an orchestra? It's an organized band of musicians that with a strict hierarchy and a strict, uh, a fixed shape and organization. They had a, a leader in front directing the band, which was new. They had also the same clothing as the military. Yeah, just like a part of an army. Yeah. Um, um, and it was based on a large violin band. The violin band was in five parts. With the modern size violins for the top parts. The three, the three middle parts were all played by what we now call altos. And the bass part was played on a large child, child uh, kind of cello, which was tuned one tone lower than modern cellos. This instrument was known as the bass de violon. And as we will see later, that this was also an instrument known in, in Italy before, actually. These orchestra uh, parts, this five-part structure, which was a nucleus of, of the orchestra, was, first of all, there were more, more top parts and more bass parts than middle parts. So an, 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 a normal division of the 24 uh, violins, for example, would have been seven violins, three for each of the middle parts, and eight bass violins in the bass. 
типичное разделение было, типичная дистрибуция для 24 струнных инструментов, 7 скрипки, 3-3-3 альты и 8 виолончей. Yeah, we're going to try it with bass and violon. Uh, uh, so it means that the top and the bottom parts were heavily orchestrated, or I mean heavily doubled, and the middle parts were rather thin. But this is not all. To the top parts, um, 8 to 10 oboes were added, just to the top part. Кроме того, к верхней части добавляли 10, от 8 до 10 габуев. And these same people would also then, for other pieces within an opera or within an, an, a musical evening, play on the recorders. So they would just stop playing oboe and pick up the recorder for the same people. И затем те, те же люди, которые играли на габуев, иногда в течение концерта, в ходе концерта или оперы переключались на плейты. Yeah. At first, recorders and break later uh, transverse groups. And later transverse groups. Mm -hmm. And the end of the 17th century, then the recorders were replaced by transverse groups. Transverse groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Also, the bass parts were the bass part was doubled by bassoons. Uh, yeah. And only for special occasions, you, we, we, we could also add trumpets and drums, always as a fixed combination, trumpets and drums, always. Uh, it's important to so and only later in the 18th century we see the arrival of clarinets and horns. It's important to know that all these wind instruments that I just described, so the oboes, the recorders, and the bassoons, did not have independent parts. They doubled the, the top and the bottom part respectively. Yeah, then also uh, there was no 16th foot bass in the orchestra. I'm speaking of the orchestra around 1700 now. Eh? There was no 16th foot, there was no double bass. Uh, now we're talking about the orchestra, uh, as we saw, for example, in the beginning of the 17th century. There was no bass. No. So this is, this is pretty much a situation as Lully would have known it. Yeah. So um, he had his violin band as a separate group, he had the double, the, the double reeds and the wind instruments as a separate group. And he had singers with basso continuo as another group. So each of the sections of this um, of his ensemble had a different name. The violin group was referred to as les grands violons et les petits violons. Uh, uh, the, 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 the really the group of, of, of very good players was even uh, called uh, no no the basic group was called les vingt quatre violons du roi. Later, literally copied in England, copied in England with the, the name the 24 figures. A smaller selected group of this band, quatre violon, would be called la petite bande, the small band. The wind instruments, so the bassoons and the and the, and the oboes, which were all the, also the people who played on the recorders, double the recorders, would be called l'écurie. Uh, which means the stables. 
Because they slept above the horses. <laughs> they were, in fact, a sort of mounted um, band that played military music on, but not real, for parades, mounted on horses. A, a third nucleus that sometimes was added to the Ecurie were the trumpet players and the drum players. They were not even paid as musicians, they were paid as military men. Because you have to imagine that they had an incredibly important role on a trumpet. You cannot play many, many notes on a natural trumpet. But the notes you play can define life or death of, or of an entire army. army. This was the, these were the people who, in the middle of the battle, had to play pa -pa -ra -pa -pa, and if they played pa -pa -ra -pa -pa, it meant another the, signal. So those people were also always paid most of all what we now would call musicians. And this is a very surprising thing to find out because mostly in music they don't occur a lot. They don't have made a lot to do with the music that we now know. Uh, so it is, it is surprising to find out that they were paid so much mm -hmm. because in, in the music that survives they don't have the major part of And then we have the, 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 well, the third or the fourth group, it depends whether you see the trumpet as a separate group. We have the singers and uh, the, con the, the lute and the harpsichord players, who were called La Chambre du Roi. because they played in the, in the private chambers and the private, um, well, in the apartments of the team. They would perform the piece that we just heard, for example, this Chalonceau uh, Baba, this Edicou. And for special occasions, all these musicians were unified into what we now call the orchestra. The fact that they all applied the same bowings, all the violins the same bowings, that all the people um, applied the same articulations, this kind of orchestral discipline is novel in the history. And that's also why we locate the origin of what we now call the orchestra in this French. Uh, now, if this would if this would constitute a typical French opera orchestra, let's say for the performance of Lully opera, we now will have a look how a typical Italian opera orchestra of the same period looks like. Um, an, an Italian orchestra, if you can call it that, uh, is also based on a, essentially on a violin group. With two up to five violins. So in the best of the case, you have a five-part texture. Performed by five players. If there was more money, then you could double the parts, but you would then initially double all the parts, not just the top and the bottom parts. Uh, in addition to that, there were 
two harpsichords and two theobos, which are extended keys. And the same would apply also for church music, except that he would then also have an organ. In this music, already early in the 17th century, we find a 16 foot added to the bass line, so a double bass added to the bass line. We find in Italy a 16 foot a double bass, whereas in France we don't have And we find no conductor because one, the, the, the leader of the band is probably one of the harpsichords. We also know from accounts that the dis there was not much discipline in this so-called orchestra. That bowing was absolutely not together, that everybody bowed in his own way. And all, everybody also felt free to add personal ornaments. Which you can do because almost never the parts are doubled. We also know that they very often um, um, improvised parts from the figured bass line. From the numbers, from the symbols, from the chords of the basso continuo, that they deduced parts from that and played in. So there are many instances in Italian sources where you see just a bass line with numbers and it says tutti gli strumenti, all the instruments. And this is impossible in, in France. You have, you have your part that you have to play. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, the rules of interpretation were fixed. I mean, yeah. more or less fixed. And it's nothing complex about that. It's no, pretty simple. Yeah. But, uh, we'll, we'll come to that when we go in detail. Uh, wind instruments, um, the first wind instrument to be added to that kind of orchestra would be around the middle of the 17th century, an occasional trumpet. Uh, uh, in, in Italy, already very early, without the usual drum, already very, from the beginning, in fact, without the normal standard drum, because trumpet and drum is always a fixed combination. We will see why that is later. Uh, wind instruments such as oboes and um, horns and bassoons were only added at the very, very end of the um, 17th century and then very reluctantly, you know. Uh, we will see that in the 18th century, both types of orchestra will sort of merge to a sort of common European, pan-European type of orchestra. This is in the 18th century. But even there, there would be an essential difference.
This is the stage with the side wings. This is the, the pit, the orchestra pit. First of all, the bottom of the of the um, um, of the orchestra pit was at the same level of the bottom of the room where the people sat. And uh, mm -hmm. can you understand it? Yeah. Uh, the the center of the orchestra would be uh, two harpsichords. Center orchestra two clavicina. Two Italian harpsichords. I have to be a bit accurate. By Italian <laughs> And the the rest of the musicians would sit. Here on benches, so and would look at each other. The leader of the ensemble sits here, that's the maestro. And from the same part. And the violinists and the wind players are mixed with each other and sit here together. So if, if you have an oboe player, they look at each other. So the, 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 the oboe, the cellist, the double bass player. So all the players. Uh, that, that, that would be the cello, the cello, fiorbo, double bass. And the Papa Group Cassino would sit at violinist, the orb, the And then the. And the Pachi and the Duhavi would be mixed in the Nasca. Also, the Sun, the Sun sits here. Uh, pa, 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 yeah. Yeah. The oboes and the recorders and the violins, because I cannot say the oboes and the recorders, it's the or was all recorded because they are the same persons. Okay. They sit next to the violin part that they double. Next to the violin player they double. So they are really sitting like that and the bench is, it looks in the middle there is a sort of double Stand. Uh, and they really sit close together. And yeah. um, we know that the first violins, the top part, they looked to the, towards the stage. And the second violins sat here with the altos. Uh, the band in Italy was only in four parts. I just told that. Huh? Uh, it's very seldom that it was five parts. The bass was already. Already in the middle of the of the of the 17th century, the the it was in four parts. Um, they could see the stage because if I now, if I would look from here. Yes, 
когда они находились внутри, но, как правило, они стояли за пределами по бокам каждого ямы. То есть пол сцены находился на уровне подбородка маэстро или, скажем, первой скрипки, они только-только могли видеть сцену. A singer, by the way, who would sing an aria would also always stand center stage in front. И певец, который исполнял арию, всегда находился по середине сцены. Yeah. Now, this, if we look at a French seating plan, если посмотреть на план красавки французского оркестра. We see, first of all, that there is only one maximum. We see, secondly, that there is here a director standing. Directing the orchestra with a roll of paper or perhaps also with a little stick. Forget about the story of Julie with his... Mm -hmm. This is just fake anime mythology. All the musicians were now sitting in circles around the director and the... Well, it's actually... This is wrong. I should draw it. Right. So if this is the orchestra pit, and if this is the harpsichord, the director stands here, so it would be probably one row and then right there. They all looked to the center. So everybody was with the back to the audience. And the, the, the leader of the band was also directing with his back. Uh, this stayed like that for the entire 18th century. But this is a typical opera situation. Yeah? So this is about orchestration. Uh, Any questions to that? Uh, what, So if this is the stage, he would be sitting the right, I would be the director, I would direct like that. I just have the harpsichord player in front of me and I can see his face and we can have contact. And maybe the musicians who are sitting there, I can see, but all the rest of By the way, the director was not called the director, it was called the batteur de mesure. Yeah. Which is essential. Eh? He did not have to invite people to be like that or do that. He just. And indeed, it is true that sometimes he actually did it with notes. Talk. Talk. Another big difference between, so this is a first major difference between an uh, Italian musical culture, the, the formation of the orchestra and the way it was organized. Eh? And we don't know why yet. I still have to explain you that later. Why? A second major difference is something that we are going to deal with, I hope, tomorrow in more detail, if we have time. This is pitch. Uh, 
надеюсь, подробнее говорить завтра, это диапазон звучания. So um, I do not have time to go into detail in that, but it is a fact that in Italy there were a number of fishes current in the different regions of Italy. But apart from the very south of Italy, so I'm referring to Sicily and Rome and Naples, where the pitch was rather low. Но кроме э, самого юга Италии, э, Неаполя, Сицилии, Рима, где диапазон был довольно низкий, Central and North Italian pitches were rather high. Э, Центральная и э, Северная Италия был принят довольно высокий диапазон. For church pitches um, were mostly or around 466, which is a half a tone higher than modern pitch, or around modern pitch. Uh, But for opera, uh, we know that um, 440 and 415, so modern pitch and half to low, were the most common pitch standards for opera. In France, the situation was a little bit different. For example, when the écurie played alone, when the, the double breed, yeah, you know the ones at the stables, when they played alone, they originally also played at this higher pitch of around 466, so half time. We will see that if we do the last subject of this seminar on, on instrumentation, we will see that this is because of the size of instruments. If you make them higher, they're smaller, and you can carry them much better while playing. But of course, when they have to play with the violin band together, they have to find a common pitch. There is some evidence that they, in, in some periods in French history, that they transposed rather than to make new instruments in the same pitch. So that they would play on the higher instruments, but play the whole piece of tone down, for example, to meet the, the pitch of the other instruments. Okay, so there is some evidence in French history that rather than like the double wind players, for example, had new instruments built for them so that they could play together with the other instruments that were tuned lower, that in some periods they did not do that, but that they rather would transpose their music, uh, a tone lower, for example, so that they could play together with instruments that were tuned a tone lower. Mm -hmm. uh, в тех случаях, когда необходимо было найти общий диапазон, вместо того, чтобы брать другие инструменты, которые были бы предназначены для более низкого диапазона, соответствующим образом перекладывали музыку, чтобы можно было играть вместе. Вот перекладывали ее на компанию. Just as Bach did with his cantatas in in Weimar. То, что делал Бах со своими кантатами в Weimar. Now. But um, two types of pitch were developed in France under the reign of Louis XIV. Uh, two diapasons were developed in France in the царстве Louis XIV. One pitch was a tone lower than modern pitch and was called ton de chapelle and ton d'opéra. One of these diapasons was on a tone lower than modern pitch and was called So this was the, 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 what we now call the low French pitch. So if you refer, to, if you would, if you like to have a cent number, this would be about three hundred ninety-two.
именно в этой э, такой гаммообразном виде, который был отмечен сегодня. So these doubles are really remainders, uh, re yeah, remainders in French musical culture of the, the visits of an Italian virtuoso at the very beginning of the 17th century. И вот эти дубли действительно напоминают как вас следы, которые итальянские виртуозы, посещавшие, игравшие в начале 17 века, We know, that, we know that Caccini has visited the French court. Um, that many, many elements of this typical French double that you heard also in the Air de Cour really are a direct descendant from Caccini's ornaments. <coughs> At this point, and also to make a little break in the talking, it's maybe good to listen to a piece of music. And I will just have you listen to Caccini, to one piece of Caccini, to demonstrate how close this French idea of double is based on Caccini's art. So we'll just listen to one of the pieces from Caccini's Nuove Musiche, which is 1604, uh, 1601, of course. Hmm? And then again to the same Ericou that we listened at this morning. Uh, just have to find a good piece here.
You see, it's just a little thing. It's not the same as Corelli with this ornament. It's not. It's very. Just to add a little bit of grace. It's not to indulge in idleness such as Corelli. So this is the close connection between one element of Italian culture and an element of French culture. Maybe try to, like, really, let's listen once more because it's good, but each time I, I, I'm, I'm treating one of those differences that we listen again at the musical example. So let's go back and listen again at a typical French orchestra versus an Italian orchestra. So let's listen at the overture of the opera, French opera. I think it's going to be artists. Давайте послушаем увертюру французской оперы Артис. can really do something. Now, I will give you an example here. Here are, in the middle of the, in the, middle of the Passacai Daniele that we will listen at, there is a group of six recorder players who are playing with their six, just two parts, so three, three. You will not, not find any oboes here because it's because the oboe players are now playing the recorders. So don't, don't believe any modern version of a French opera, modern I mean even authentic, where you hear recorders and oboes, because it's not possible. 
даже если это аутентичная версия, то одновременно сыграют кобой и толчью. Это невозможно. Это невозможно. Already hear them doubling the violence. Soprano recorders, I mean, now your question directly to a recorder player, right? and that's just one of mine. Uh, soprano recorders, you find almost no, not, almost not. Petite flute is so rare, and um, even in Italian opera, when you hear now the modern versions that are circulating of uh, uh, Monteverdi with soprano recorders, don't believe one thing. Uh, even with uh, cornet players and trombone players, they are just not in Italian opera. Orfeo, yes, but Orfeo is a court opera. A commercial opera, Ritorno di Lisse, Incorazione di Popea, just violins and harpsichords. That's all. So soprano recorders, bye bye. Which ones? Altos and tenors? No, this is just altos here. Playing in the low register, but playing together. Three, four, five, six together. Do you understand that? Well, not totally. Do you want? Do you want her to translate that? Перевести. Да, да, да. 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 Да, <laughs> soprano recorders are very, very rare in music at all. No, uh, soprano are very rare in music at all. Yes. For example, yeah, but for example, in the entire um, uh, Italian early Baroque, I have found one indication for anything smaller than an alto. For uh, the uh, Italian Baroque music, Одну только ссылку, одну только ссылку я нашел на на что-либо меньше альта. And in French and German opera, it's only used whatever. Sometimes when you see that there are bird imitations, that it would say petite flute, and even then it's not sure it should be a recorder. It could just be transverse. А итальянской и немецкой барочной оперной музыки использовались такие инструменты только 
когда должно было изображать, скажем, птичье пение, так тогда вот упоминается Плейта Пикула. И то, в общем, не факт, что это не было флейта. So, um, if you now find all these versions of Italian early Baroque operas, Monteverdi operas, uh, you can find, I will not name names because it's, it's a little bit nasty if I do that for, for colleagues, but if you find all these operas where you have lots of trombones and recorders and cornets, even if it's well played, just it doesn't fit with the historical information. Uh, Trombones, cornets. So there's only Monteverdi opera in which there is actually a limited use of all these instruments, that's Orfeo, but all the operas afterwards is just for violins and this is the beginning of uh, Orfeo by Sartori. Also observe that there is no real melody. The top part is just the top of the sound spectrum. There is no real melody. I think that this is the opportunity. No. Polyphony. return just once where we stopped with the ornamentation and give you a short overview of the typical French, French ornaments as they exist. So you have to understand that um, at one hand, at one hand, on the at, at one hand, there was a, because I have to be careful what I say, um, <laughs> the, the, on, on. on the one hand, there was an um, absolute, um, I mean, there was only one set of ornaments applied by all instrumentalists and composers, but they each had their different sign symbols to indicate them. Uh, Один набор орнаментов, который использовался всеми инструменталистами и и композиторами, но у каждого был какой-то определенный. So that they have, it's all referring to the same basic set of ornaments, but it's it's the symbols that composers use to represent them are that can be different. Но Композиторы могли пользоваться различными обозначениями для этих ордентов, различные символы. There's actually no big discussion upon the interpretation of French ornaments. There's only one problem, that is that about half of the treatises seem to indicate that you should do the ornament before the beat, and on the other half of the treatises seems to imply that you should do the ornaments on the beat. Uh, Нет, в общем, 
Мне кажется, была бы дискуссия по интерпретации этих значков. Единственная проблема, которая посвящена большому количеству трактатов, например, половина трактатов считает, что орнамент должен играться украшение в долю, что, к, да, что украшение должно либо, либо перед долей, либо в долю. So there is absolutely, I can give you not a definite answer on that, because it's still a question of debate. And probably it also reflects different tastes in the French Baroque, and it could also, so not only different tastes, but it also also different, uh, reflect different instruments, on which on one instrument you would rather do before the beat, without the same ornament, on another instrument you do to on the beat. Uh, разные тенденции, которые существовали во французской барочной музыке в свое время, отражали различные вкусы, возможно, это относилось также к различным инструментам. На каких-то инструментах играли орнамент до доли, на каких-то в доле. So, um, there are mostly one note ornaments. В основном это орнаменты в одну ногу. So, I would first start, and I use the symbols of Otete, 1707. And this, so I always give first the ornament and then I write it in Bill Notes. This ornament is called Port de Voix. Which is Port de Voix, which literally translated means um, to carry the voice, because it's da, you carry it as it is the voice to the next note. Uh, so it's very much like a carrying of the voice. Буквально голос подносится к следующей ноте. But whether you should do da or da, this is still a question of debate. Но каким образом это конкретно происходит, до сих пор обсуждается. Yeah. The second ornament, again, only with the symbol, symbols of Otter, because you can, I could use many different symbols here, I'm used to those, yeah. is so, called Kulma. Kulma, то есть опять же обозначение Otter, что могут быть много других значков. And the Kulma is just the same thing as the Port of War, but now you come from upstairs. Кульма означает лечение. Кульма. 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 So it's a, 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 a flowing into the note. As a Течение в ноту. Instead of da, you have to carry the voice and da, you just flow into the note. подносить голос, он втекает в ноту. Again, if you would do, if you would have to do ah or ah, I don't know whether do it before the or The next one. It's already over with my beautiful. <laughs> the next one is called battement. Which means a little stroke. Which is a quick switch to the notes below. Ta. Battement. So ta, or, but again ta or ta, up to interpretation. Right? So you go one note below and you return. Battement. I'm so sorry I for this, but. Battement, really. <coughs> so, which means literally a stroke, a little striking of the voice. Ta. The next one is called cadence. Следующий ornament is cadence. Cadence, yeah. Or also trio. Или три. Trio or cadence. And it's always from the top note, always, and 
a number of transitions. So you just keep switching a number of times according to the situation. But it's always a top note first. The note above, I'm sorry, not the top note, the note above. So musicians keep asking me, yes, but is that not according to the harmony, whether we should start with the note above or with the note itself? No, it is always with the note above. Another basic one is called flatté or flattement. Еще один из основных орнаментов это флатно. If indicated at all, it is often indicated with a little wave. Если он вообще обозначен, то обозначен он как небольшой волной. And flatement uh, literally means to inflate the note, eh? Flatement означает буквально вот So you have well, I don't. I think in vocal music I've never done it. You would do it with vibrato. But on an instrument you will do it with your fingers, not with air support on wind instrument. На инструменте это при помощи пальцев. So you do it with one finger over a hole, and it's the same for violin. You do it with with the finger. So it's not so when на на духовом и на на струнном инструменте помощью пальцев. I suppose, however, in vocal music, it's rather a dynamic wave ring. В вокальной музыке надо полагать это такая волновая динамика. Yeah. Now the rest of the ornaments are really variations upon this basic set. For example, we have this, this symbol, which is a cadence appuyée. Emphasized trill or cadence. Uh, uh, but this is a typical term for auditeur and a typical symbol for auditeur. You have to find it. It exists also in other music, but you have to find then the way that this specific author calls that. So instead of ta, you would probably have hiya. Instead of hiya, which is a normal cadence, a normal cross, you have a much longer alokatura. So this is ta, ta, tiram. This would be this one. Ta, tiram. Whereas this one would be. You hear the difference? I just lengthen the coulé as it were. It's a combination of a coulé, of coulement, with a cadence. The next one is also a combination because it combines an uh, clock with a batemar. Uh, so instead of ta, which is a clock you have uh, you have ta, ta. Instead of ta, so you go once more. Ta. That's a combined one.
So, example, if we take a classical cadence, there is nothing here, it's just tour de chant. Tour de chant. Wait. Um, so, for example, if I, this is the tour de chant, this symbol, a little uh, new shape. So, if I perform tour de chant, tour de chant, which means um, singing round, you know, a, 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 a round, a roundabout of singing. So you perform it, because you know already how to perform this. If I perform without the two, the shy, la, 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 that's the cadence as it is without the two, the Let's me do that again. Yeah? Now I will also perform, this is without the two, the yes. Now with? So I do, when I write it out, and I will write it out at the same spot, I don't have to... Same cadence now, but with a tour de gosier. 
associate, which means um, a roundabout in the throat. It's almost the same as a tour de chat, it's a little bit different. Instead of we have so I add to the extreme end of this note, I add and I stop. So, and I can combine them. And before I know it, I have double. Mm -hmm. I combine it now. Yeah, but then I have to write one ornament on each page, you know? No, it's not in there. But what you could, yeah, it's not in there. No. But you can, you can come here and there. By the way, I'm going to have a break now. Our treatise is spread. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, this is the last thing I said before the, before the break. Последнее слово перед перерывом. I have uh, there is a handout which is called bibliography and methodology. Существует handout, который называется библиография и методология. And this is my selection of books and big articles, only big articles, that I find important for everybody who wants to study early music. So in this list you will find books that make lists of all the French ornamentation tables. Uh, yeah, there are many, many, many of them. I mean, it's not so that I could take them with me or anything. Huh? So um, I can, if you have, if you have ordered a list, I can indicate that to you. Если вы заказали этот handout, я могу потом ответить для вас. Look, look for the books on performance practice as a whole. Представьте, возьмите любую книгу о исполнительской практике. Or Baroque ornamentation. Huh? It is not so important, I think, that I gave you give you an exact list of this man says that and this man says that. It's much more important to first of all know which ornaments there are and secondly why they are the way they are, where they come from. Inégalité. As what? Inégalité. Последний элемент, который определяет разницу между двумя стилями, в французской порочной музыке есть такое явление, которое называется inégalité, неравенство. Inégalité seems to be so normal in in French music that it is applied. Everywhere, and it's it the the most simple rule says. I mean, that's, at least that's what people think. That you should just lengthen of two equal notes. You should lengthen the first and shorten the second. Это настолько типичное явление, что практически повсюду оно наблюдается, описывается следующим образом: инегалите, неравенство из двух равных нот следует удлинить первую и сократить вторую. So instead of you would do instead of having them equal, you would Now, now um, 
First of all, I would like to add that the unequal performance of equally notated notes is not the privilege of French music alone. Прежде всего, нужно отметить, что неравное исполнение равно отмеченных нот не есть привилегия французской музыки исключительно. Это также и в Италии встречается. And in Italian music, it, um, it is connected with the typical Italian notion of sprezzatura. И в итальянской музыке это связано с типичным итальянским понятием sprezzatura. And sprezzatura, I will write it on the blackboard. Uh, the whiteboard. Sprezzatura actually means a sort of, well, Caccini describes it as a sort of noble disdain. Caccini описывает sprezzatura как нечто вроде благородного презрения. It means freedom, as it were. Означает как бы свободу. It is the way in Italian late Renaissance and early Baroque music of performing something with grace that would otherwise be a little bit too stiff and too strict. It's actually a, a, a notion that does not come from music, but that comes from etiquette. Понятие взято из этикета Ренессанса. It means that you have to study the way you behave, you clothe, you move, but at the end it has to look at it as if it is the most natural thing of the world. Смысл заключается в том, что необходимо специально учиться двигаться и одеваться, но Стараться, чтобы в конечном итоге это выглядело как будто все это совершенно естественно, ваше поведение и манера одеваться. Все это связано с ренессансом идеала придворного. And it's then uh, trans transposed to music by Caccini around 1600. And by, by Caccini, it gets another interpretation. It means don't follow the notes too strictly. Just of, sort of sing around them <coughs> and let them sound as if you were improvising them on the very spot. The понятие из этикета переносится в музыку Caccini примерно в 1600 году. Предлагает не слишком сильно следовать написанным нотам, а как бы петь вокруг них и делать так, чтобы это звучало словно певец прямо на ходу или исполнитель на ходу импровизирует. For example, if you were to sing this cadence, вот, например, при исполнении подобного каданса. It is written Yali. But you will probably perform Instead of making them really equal, This is something you cannot write really. Это нечто, что невозможно на самом деле записать. Because the degree of irregularity is just too refined to fix in notation. Что игра вот этих неправильностей слишком тонка, чтобы можно было ее сфиксировать на письме. But if you were to write it out, you would probably write something like that. И если попытаться это изобразить, то можно как-то вот так вот это. It is of course much too strict when I perform it because now I perform it as a rhythm. And it loses again its sprezzatura. So if I write it 
out and I perform it as I see it, I would I would be inclined to perform it in a rhythmical way. And again, it loses then its aspect of spiritual. So I don't write it out, and I sing, I still write this, but I perform something that goes close to this. Yeah, and uh, Italians preferred not to write it out. It's only Caccini who demonstrated this imitation. But the principles are explained in other treatises. And the general principle of for Italian inegalité, as it were, и общий принцип для, так сказать, итальянского инегалиты неравенства. Is that you would, from any group of notes that you consider to be a unity, you учаясь в том, что из любой группы нот, которые вы воспринимаете как нечто единое, the principle is that you start slow, you speed up, and you uh, arrive ahead of time at the end. So instead of that means you start with a low note. You, then you have to hurry because you're behind schedule. You speed up so much that you're ahead of time. But then you have to wait on the last note. Now, if you apply that to a group of four notes, indeed, what you get is instead of you get if you write it out. And there we are again with our example here. Yeah? This is the Italian principle. Uh, also for largely sense. Huh? You understand? This is the Italian idea of, of inegalité. It is important to, to know that this is a melodic ornament and not a rhythmic one. Yeah. In French, in French music, however, starting in the time of Louis XIV, we have a t totally different type of inequality. Which would entail that instead of performing ta -ra 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 -ra, you would perform ya -ra 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 -ra. you would sort of waver uh, it's the same kind of uh, wavering that you find in jazz music. Again, I cannot write it out unless I would add dots. So instead of like, but then again, if I were to read that, if I find that, I will be inclined as a musician to perform it rhythmically. And actually, yeah, and actually, the treatises did, uh, uh, that treat that subject say that the amount of inegality, that this is the maximum of proportion between three lengths here and one length there. So you cannot go over that. So, 
Yeah. The maximum amount of inequality for two equal nodes is that. That means that normally inequality moves at a proportion that is underneath that. Что говорит о том, что обычно пропорция была более низкой. Instead of la 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 la, which is regular, I don't have la 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 la, which is too extreme. Это экстремально. Have la 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 la, and it's also not equal. La 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 la. Actually, here I'm sometimes using the Italian la 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 the inversion. Иногда это резкая инверсия. There were, however, it wouldn't be French music. There were codifications. Однако это была не была бы французская музыка, если не было кодификации. And yeah, this goes quickly this way. Well, okay. And what is the principle in French music of inégalité? In all duple meters, so in all measures that play. Во всех двойных размерах по французской. The value that becomes inégal is one fourth of the beats. This is in duple meters. For example, if I have this meter, which is four four, and in which the beat is a quarter note. The inégalité is on the level of the sixteenth. Not on the level of the eight notes. So I take the fourth subdivision of the beat. This becomes inégal. Yeah. In triple meters. The rule is different. There, it's the half of the beat. That means that in this this bar, which is actually three four, the inégalité is on the level of the eight notes. Yeah. Um, which means that this, in this um, measure, which is actually 2-2, two, two, the beat is a half note. It's the same length as 4-4, four, four, but the beat in this measure is, two, is on the half note. It means that the inequality is on the level of the eight notes. Two half notes, so the beat is a half note. Yeah. So this is pretty clear. Huh? In, um, if you have, for example, I don't know, uh, two eight. No, 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 I will not, I will not give you the example. Sorry, that's an exception. <laughs> um, in this bar, however, C barré, C barré was called the, 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 the bar with the double nature. Because it was described sometimes as a slow 2-2, two -two, as a slow version of this. But sometimes it was described also as a fast version of this, in yeah, which you have, yeah, in which you would still have the quarter note as a beat. Mm -hmm. So if this moves at, I'm seeing 16 notes. This would be. That's too true. But now here I have which I can still I 
can still feel it in both ways. But, and this is strange, all the treatises agree that in this part, the inegality is on the level of the 16th note, and not on the 8th notes. No. Интересно то, что все трактаты соглашаются, что в данном случае, в таком такте, инегалите будет составлять шестнадцатую, а не восьмую. This is very strange, because if you look at practical music, I have found lots of pieces written in this, where I would automatically do the inegalite on the end. Это странно, потому что масса вещей существует в таком размере, где автоматически хочется такого рода yeah, this is this is some kind of so question mark that there is. Yeah. Okay, but having said all this, having given all the, and there's more difference. That the, the next difference is that in the specific style of playing the basso continuo, but we'll hear that when my wife arrives next week. Uh, uh, next, next week. Mm -hmm. So the next or the last major difference between Italian and French style. Следующий последний, наверное, основная разница между французскими и итальянскими стилями заключается в манере исполнения басо continuo. Of realizing it. Но узнаем мы об этом на следующей неделе, когда приедет жена Питера играть на полисине. And we could go on many things, but now I would really like to spend the last 40 minutes. It's too short the other day. In finding out where these differences come from and why Italian is so different as French. Но последние 40 минут сегодняшней сегодняшней посвятить выяснению того, почему же итальянский стиль так отличается от французского. I think the first major reason, and I cannot spend a lot of time on that now, so I have to summarize. The first major reason is the structure of society and the place of music in it. Первая основная причина, и, к сожалению, мы не можем слишком долго остановиться на этом, придется говорить э, обобщенно, но основная причина заключается в структуре общества и в том месте, которое мы должны заниматься. If you look at the history of Italy in the 17th century, and why the 17th century, because it's then when the Italian national style originated. Если мы посмотрим на историю Италии в 17 веке, потому что именно в 17 веке we see that Italy was a country that was not in war anymore after having had a long period of war. Мы увидим, что после долгого периода войн Италия наконец оказалась в состоянии мира. That means no external and internal wars, because if you, as you know, Italy is not a country. It's, it was a sort of amalgam of all different states with different structures. But whereas Italian as a region um, was known in the 16th century for its very high quality products and for its high uh, uh, standards in craftsmanship. And whereas in the 16th century it was still a leading economic nation in Europe. In the 17th century, it lost that role. Why? Because there were um, other cities, such as Amsterdam, that took over Italy's function as a, as a harbor. Um, huh? 
Of course, also because the Mediterranean was not, uh, not anymore the central place of focus in Europe, but now the merchant, um, the trade ways with the Indies, East and West, were becoming important. And America and Japan, for example. Yeah, it was all called the Indies. Mm. Um, and also because cities like Amsterdam and other cities in the north uh, started to produce products that were cheaper and that were almost machine -like or factory like produced. И еще и также потому что такие города как Амстердам и других северноевропейских города стали производиться какие-то изделия, продукты почти почти что фабричным способом. Это дешевле соответственно. Италия не хотела этого. Система Италии, Италия была так хорошо организована, что гильдии имели такую силу, что они просто не позволяли повысить цены lower their prices because that would also entail that they would lower their um, um, their standards for craftsmanship. Uh, in Italy, it was very good, it was very well organized in the time, and there were so many strong guilds of craftsmanship, guilds of craftsmanship, that they would in order to reduce the price of their production, because it was also the beginning of the level of quality of production. So very, very rapidly, Italy evolved to a country for luxury products. Luxury products for the very rich. So two things typify Italy in the 17th century. First, that they wanted politically to maintain the balance as it was. Два параметра определяют Италию в XVII веке. С одной стороны, политически она стремилась сохранить существующий баланс. Please, no war. Пожалуйста, без, без, без войн. And Хотели избежать войны. Secondly, they wanted to specialize in high quality products. И кроме того, Италия специализировалась в высококачественных, высококачественных продуктах. There was a third element. Третий элемент. Counter-reformation. Counter-reformация. And so, no Protestantism in Italy. And the Counter-Reformation in Italy was a very soft Counter-Reformation. Nothing like the Spanish Counter-Reformation in other parts of Europe. The concept of tourism is really invented in Italy in the 17th century. Концепция туризма на самом деле изобретена в Италии в XVII веке. Every rich man or woman or family as a whole traveled to Italy to spend or or to have a sort of the grand tour, which was the concluding part of your education before you you got a pension. Всякий богатый человек или богатая семья непременно совершал путешествие по Италии. Because, by the way, this this notion still exists among students. After university, you you take your rucksack and you travel in Europe, you know. Ah, это среди университетских студентов по-прежнему сохранилась такая традиция, закончив институт, они берут рюкзак. This is still the remainder of that tradition. Mm -hmm. And so, or uh, in, in a better case, even if you are wealthy enough, you just have a house or you rent an apartment in Venice during Carnival. Mm -hmm. So, as a whole, Italy has a very well-structured and well-balanced society with a very low amount of inner friction. And this is also why you see that if we speak of music now, music in Italy is literally everywhere because there are no major courts anymore. It's much more dispersed amongst 
churches, small courts, um, different situations. You could find music everywhere and high quality music. Music and music of high quality is heard everywhere. In churches, in small courts, in high quality music. Music becomes a part, a daily part of life in Italy. Every major city has at least five, six churches that, uh, with permanent musicians in their service. The training of musicians was regulated by the guilds and organized by the guilds. Обучение музыкантов организуется гильдия. And for those for those special situations, there were even additional institutions such as the the orphanages in the ospedale in Venice and the conservatori in Naples, where professional musicians were being trained. So for for special Apart from the guild system that provided musicians, there were even special institutions, specialized institutions. In Venice, we have the Ospedale, and in Naples, we have the Conservatory. Помимо гильдии, которые занимались образованием музыкантов, существовали специальные заведения, которые готовили музыкантов. Ospedale в Венеции и Conservatory. И Conservatory. In Naples. Неаполе. Both meant um, in fact, often, bo both were orphanages. Because ospedale means hospital, if you translate the more So, guest house, which will translate it? Whereas conservatorio is a place where you keep, where you can serve people. A conservatory is a place where you keep and maintain people. It's only later that they train those people in Venice, and all girls and it was all boys. It's only later that they train them as professional musicians. And it was only later that they trained them as professional musicians. And it was only later that they trained them as professional musicians. And it was only later that they trained them as professional musicians. So that means that uh, in Italy, music was part of the entire society, of every layer of society. There was no gradation or not much gradation. Um, uh, everybody had access to music. It was part of the enjoyment of life in Italy. Because it had to serve so many, or it was played in so many different circumstances. In the most cases it was just, and because there were so high um, crafts and artistic criteria. Music was basically based, uh, played for the music itself. I have not found a lot of Italian music that is specifically composed um, to a specific person, to honor a specific person. Also in the good between quotation marks, Catholic tradition, um, the, the mass music is music that you should enjoy. Eh? The, the whole concept in Catholicism at that time was that there are beautiful images, beautiful music, lovely smells, and that it sort of gives you a sort of high feeling. Кроме того, в католической традиции музыка для мессы предназначалась для того, чтобы особое приподнятое состояние создавать и концепция католичества в те времена заключалась в том, что вот это сочетание прекрасной музыки, прекрасных образов, 
я благовоний курящихся в церкви, это тогда состояние транса вызывало у людей. We see that in Protestant countries the situation is very different. There you are um, instructed by music. In Italy you're not instructed at all, you just enjoy it. Yeah. So, as opposed to that, France uh, yeah, and, and the other thing is, politically as a whole, Italy did not mean a lot anymore. Eh? So I have said that, I think. Yeah? It becomes the pleasure garden of Europe. Mm -hmm. France, on the contrary, is a, is a country that comes out of terrible wars of the 16th century and is devastated. France is разорена страшными войнами, которые происходили в XVI веке. And, and to organize this new country, you see that the four Bourbon kings, Bourbon, I think, kings of the 17th century, really try to centralize France again and to build it or to direct it or to construct around Paris and the French court. И четыре короля царства династии Бурбонов, которые царствуют в XVII веке во Франции, пытаются как-то ее централизовать объединить страну, э, структурировать вокруг Парижа. Almost all the French 17th century music that we know has been or was composed in function of the court. It's court music. Uh, практически вся французская музыка 17 века так или иначе связана с uh, королевским двором. Uh, there's almost no other music that we know of that was not written for the court. Практически не знаю ни один it's very hard to think of examples. Eh? Mm -hmm. So, Colombe, yeah, well, I mean, with court, I mean, just a little bit um, further than music that was not just court composers, eh? because in that sense, Charpentier is also not court music. But these are all people, Saint Colomb uh, included, that wanted, eagerly wanted to have a court uh, <coughs> position because there was nothing else simply. No, uh, uh, you could very well say that France in the 17th century is everything around Paris. Mm, you have Paris and the rest. Um, oh, uh, this is not only, it's not only this, this is a mere fact, but music and the arts in general are going to be used by these Bourbon kings in their propaganda machine. Кроме того, музыка и искусство в целом используются бурбонами в пропаганде. There was an enormous propaganda machine, uh, especially under the reign of Louis XIV. And the exportation of French music was at the same time the exportation of the French monarchical uh, idea and principle. Export французской музыки в то время одновременно был экспортом и популяризацией французской идеала французской монархии и французского монархического принципа. Yeah, and this is why we find that all this music sounds so personalized. Поэтому и складывается впечатление, что вся эта музыка звучит так uh, right? We have, a, a, there was a difference on, on our list between the singing quality of Italian music and the declaiming quality of French music. I could say that in Italian music I don't need an audience, I can do it as well for myself because it's so beautiful and I enjoy it. But 
But French music I have to play for somebody, otherwise there is no meaning in what I do. Yeah, and I'm generalizing now, but the, the only difference that there is, the only shade of difference that, that grows is at the very end of the reign of uh, um, Louis XIV, that means to the very end of the 17th century. The, the only difference in, in nature of French, French music was a, was a no, no, I will phrase it differently. Uh, now, this is the, the, the principle of French music. So, you could say that French music equals court music. I think that is safe to say. There is only one other influence, one alternative influence to that. And these are the alternatives offered at all the moments that the French king didn't reign, at all the uh, periods of regence. And there were different ones in the French 17th uh, century uh, history. So there was a very important one, I just, uh, just um, mentioned too, there was a very important one in the middle of the 17th century when Cardinal Mazarin, who was actually Giulio Mazzarini, ruled the country. This is one. Uh, who, um, who ruled because Louis XIV was still too young. And there was another period at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, um, well, not beginning of the 18th century, when Philippe d'Orléans, who I think was the nephew of Louis XIV, uh, reigned because Louis XV was still too young. Between 15 and 18. Uh, yeah, 1715 is the beginning of the regions under the Philip uh, Dorian, mm -hmm. until 1723, when then uh, Louis XV was born. 17? 15 until 1723. And in the beginning of the 18th century, in 1723, the king is Philip Dorian. Philip Dorian, yeah. Philip Orleans, because Louis XV. This last period is preceded already by a sort of period of transition from what we could call really um, Louis XIV uh, as a king until this Regency period. And this period of transition is when Louis XIV withdraw, in fact, from public life and just disappeared in Versailles, his chateau, and didn't bother anymore. Uh, между расцветом французского абсолютизма в царстве uh, Людовика XIV и периодом регенства был такой небольшой переход, когда uh, Людовик XIV uh, отошел от, от общественной жизни и просто закрылся в своем Версале, более не, не интересовался прочими делами, внешним миром. Both periods of Regency, so the one in the middle of the 17th century and the one at the beginning of the 18th century, are typified by the import, import of foreign art read Italian art. Why is that? Because the emphasis shifted from the court with the king as its central figure to the city of Paris again with the bourgeoisie as, a, as the main uh, consumers of art. Yeah. And I told you before that the whole um, quarrel about French versus Italian style originated in France around 1700. Now, around 1700, that's already the moment that Louis XIV was well back in his Versailles and didn't bother anymore. Uh, 
как мы уже говорили, зародился как раз где-то в районе 1700 -го года, когда э, Людовик XIV уже не показывался из, из Версаля. So if we then describe the three major periods of French music of yeah. we have the first period in the middle of the 17th century that is pure Italian music. So we don't count. We see that Rossi and Cavalli were in Paris. Uh, but this doesn't count for French music, of Then we have the construction of the, the whole propaganda machine with music as its central, um, the combined art of music in the opera, the grand tragedy lyrique under Louis XIV. Then propaganda music as the music opera. That was always a sort of tribute to the king. Every French opera is a tribute. This is the moment that what we call the French national style is really constructed. Of course, with the leading figure character Jean-Baptiste Lully. Whose real name was Giovanni Battista Lulli? <laughs> but he was 14 when he came in France. So. And then we have the, the end of this period, around 1700, towards, I would say, until about 1723, when we have um, a less noble and aristocrat uh, style uh, emerging. It still uses the same vocabulary that was developed under the cycle of Louis XIV. But the, 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 the program that was so central to, to the nature of French music disappeared. <coughs> because the king is not there anymore. Huh? So we get a, a more gallant style. And this is a transition where in France you were not expected anymore as an aristocrat to behave as a gentilhomme, but where all of a sudden you were expected to behave as a gallant homme. The difference is that the gentilhomme's ideals are still based on valor and virtue and duty. Whereas the, the, the aesthetic of the Galanto is just to be gracious and to be friendly and nice and soft. For people who know some uh, who know something about visual arts, um, I would the difference is for example because I always remember it like that, um, or or as a mnemonic device, I would say that the, the, the French grand style, uh, Louis XIV, is, is really apparent in the paintings of Rigaud, Rigaud Rigueur. Uh, <coughs> Rigaud or Le Sueur, that's another painter. Maybe there are, I will see, there were some paintings of those paintings here in the Hermitage. And then the new style, the, the central figure to it is Watteau. Watteau. 
So we are already moving to what later becomes the Rokoko. Yeah? Now, most of the instrumental music that we know, um, from Marais Marais to François Couperin to all these kind of composers, is composed exactly on the moment of transition. So, you will indeed recognize uh, the French vocabulary in, um, uh, developed under, the, uh, under Louis XIV, or under Louis, I would say. <coughs> but you already also find terminologies like contact, sonat, which is clearly in Italian, I mean. The problem is that it is very difficult to form a very clear idea on what this grand style represented, because most of the sources of Lully's music are late 17th century sources. So, the problem is of forming an idea on what Lully really was, what, what this style was. The problem of that is that the sources that we have, the extant sources, including all the music, is mostly late 17th century, and so not, not sources from Lully himself. Трудно сказать, что Лули сам действительно себя представлял, потому что большинство источников, которые мы располагаем, датируются концом 17 века. France indulged in this Lullian and Louis XIV atmosphere for so long. Франция так долго купалась в атмосфере двора короля солнца и yeah. So, if we radiate power, as is De Lalande, the Te Deum, the Te Deum is the piece that you see for the king. Yeah. At the other hand, we have the soft French music, the friendly, the one that flatters the ear. Which is autote, which is flute that is so soft, not the violin that is very concrete, but the flute. The flute that can make um, um, clouds of sounds rather than um, um, patterns with lines. A violin says T, whereas a flute says Uh, and, and this is also the reason why the, 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 in, in the flute section, I would say, that the transverse flute replaced the recorder. Because a recorder is always T, it's concrete, it has the definition. <coughs> and a transverse flute can also be very flute. Just as the paintings of Watteau. Yeah. So this is we have to refer to two different types of French style. Both are national. Both are typical French. Yeah. So this to say that part of the difference, the essential differences, if, I, if we look back to our lists again, we will see that many of the adjectives that we've written on the, on the whiteboard really have to do with the place of music in both countries' society. And we can have a quick look. Um, which, which of the elements we can already strive away that we have already an, an explanation for? Uh, 
So I think that. So this is to say that part of the difference, the essential differences, if, I, if we look back to our lists again, we will see that many of the adjectives that were written on the, on the whiteboard really have to do with the place of music in both countries' society. And we can have a quick look. Um, which, which of the elements we can already swipe away that we have already an, an explanation for? So I think that this is already clear. Also this because this is referred to the whether music has a program, whether there is a purpose in it, or whether it's just for the music itself. But we still, we still have to find, I cannot link this with social structures. So we have to find for, uh, look for another reason for, for that. Social structure? I'm not sure. This more or less. Because when you sing, you But you play, you are speaking to somebody. So, yes and no, I would say. Uh, linear and dance. Maybe there is a little element, because what is dancing? Why was Louis XIV a very good dancer? Why did all the Bourbon kings dance? Because dance, because dance becomes a part of the propaganda machine. In which way? Well, what do you do when you dance? And look at all the French choreographies. You divide space. You make your tracé. And, uh, and you, she said you can, you can tell the, the, the national character by ways of taking Of course, you know, I, I agree, but I'm, what I'm doing now is... Uh, I'm just eliminating all these factors for which we already have a full explanation. By, by social structures. And I will not, I cannot, in, in all honesty, I cannot say that I understand why the basic sound versus articulation between Italian and French is, is the way it is, because, not, because I understand that French had a chord and Italy didn't. So there must be still another reason for that. And reason. Um, improvisation, ornamentation, well, I don't really find any reason for that in social, but and I think for these two we also have to wait for another good reason. Now, so it's very clear that we have already about half of our differences. We already understand where it comes from. Получается, что примерно половину различных уже объяснили, поняли, откуда они идут. 
But what is the basis for the other difference? Но в чем основание для других различий? If you want to know, comment see tomorrow.